Chapter 22 Prophecies Fulfilled When the time passed at which the Lord's coming was first expected in the spring of 1844, those who had looked in faith for His appearing were for a season involved in doubt and uncertainty. While the world regarded them as having been utterly defeated and proved to have been cherishing a delusion, their source of consolation was still the Word of God. Many continued to search the Scriptures, examining anew the evidences of their faith and carefully studying the prophecies to obtain further light. The Bible testimony in support of their position seemed clear and conclusive. Signs which could not be mistaken pointed to the coming of Christ as near. The special blessing of the Lord, both in the conversion of sinners and the revival of spiritual life among Christians, had testified that the message was of heaven. And though the believers could not explain their disappointment, they felt assured that God had led them in their past experience. Interwoven with prophecies which they had regarded as applying to the time of the Second Advent, was instruction specially adapted to their state of uncertainty and suspense, and encouraging them to wait patiently in the faith that what was now dark to their understanding would in due time be made plain. Among these prophecies was that of Habakkuk 2, 1-4. I will stand upon my watch, and set me upon the tower, and will watch to see what he will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved, and the Lord answered me, and said, Write the vision, and make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak, and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. As early as 1842, the direction given in this prophecy to write the vision and make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it, had suggested to Charles Fitch the preparation of a prophetic chart to illustrate the visions of Daniel and the Revelation. The publication of this chart was regarded as a fulfillment of the command given by Habakkuk. No one, however, then noticed that an apparent delay in the accomplishment of the vision, a tarrying time, is presented in the same prophecy. After the disappointment, this scripture appeared very significant. The vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. The just shall live by his faith. A portion of Ezekiel's prophecy also was a source of strength and comfort to the believers. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, what is that proverb that ye have in the land of Israel, saying, The days are prolonged, and every vision faileth? Tell them therefore, Thus saith the Lord God, The days are at hand, and the effect of every vision. I will speak, and the word that I shall speak shall come to pass, and it shall be no more prolonged. They of the house of Israel say, The vision that he seeth is for many days to come, and he prophesieth of the times that are afar off. Therefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, There shall none of my words be prolonged any more, but the word which I have spoken shall be done. Ezekiel 12, 21-25, 27, and 28. The waiting ones rejoiced, believing that he who knows the end from the beginning had looked down through the ages and foreseeing their disappointment had given them words of courage and hope. Had it not been for such portions of Scripture admonishing them to wait with patience and to hold fast their confidence in God's Word, their faith would have failed in that trying hour. The parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25 also illustrates the experience of the Adventist people. In Matthew 24, in answer to the question of his disciples concerning the sign of his coming and of the end of the world, Christ had pointed out some of the most important events in the history of the world and of the church from his first to his second advent, namely the destruction of Jerusalem, the great tribulation of the church under the pagan and papal persecutions, 
the darkening of the sun and moon and the falling of the stars. After this he spoke of his coming in his kingdom, and related the parable describing the two classes of servants who look for his appearing. Chapter 25 opens with the words, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. Here is brought to view the church living in the last days, the same that is pointed out in the close of chapter 24. In this parable their experience is illustrated by the incidents of an eastern marriage. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. The coming of Christ, as announced by the first angel's message, was understood to be represented by the coming of the bridegroom. The widespread reformation under the proclamation of his soon coming answered to the going forth of the virgins. In this parable, as in that of Matthew 24, two classes are represented. All had taken their lamps, the Bible, and by its light had gone forth to meet the bridegroom. But while they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. The latter class had received the grace of God, the regenerating, enlightening power of the Holy Spirit, which renders His word a lamp to the feet and a light to the path. In the fear of God they had studied the scriptures to learn the truth and had earnestly sought for purity of heart and life. These had a personal experience, a faith in God and in His Word, which could not be overthrown by disappointment and delay. Others took their lamps and took no oil with them. They had moved from impulse. Their fears had been excited by the solemn message, but they had depended upon the faith of their brethren. Satisfied with the flickering light of good emotions, without a thorough understanding of the truth or a genuine work of grace in the heart. These had gone forth to meet the Lord, full of hope in the prospect of immediate reward, but they were not prepared for delay and disappointment. When trials came, their faith failed, and their lights burned dim. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. By the tarrying of the bridegroom is represented the passing of the time when the Lord was expected, the disappointment, and the seeming delay. In this time of uncertainty, the interest of the superficial and half-hearted soon began to waver, and their efforts to relax. But those whose faith was based on a personal knowledge of the Bible had a rock beneath their feet, which the waves of disappointment could not wash away. They all slumbered and slept, one class in unconcern and abandonment of their faith, the other class patiently waiting till clearer light should be given. Yet in the night of trial the latter seemed to lose to some extent their zeal and devotion. The half-hearted and superficial could no longer lean upon the faith of their brethren. Each must stand or fall for himself. About this time fanaticism began to appear. Some who had professed to be zealous believers in the message rejected the word of God as the one infallible guide and claiming to be led by the Spirit, gave themselves up to the control of their own feelings, impressions, and imaginations. There were some who manifested a blind and bigoted zeal, denouncing all who would not sanction their course. Their fanatical ideas and exercises met with no sympathy from the great body of Adventists, yet they served to bring reproach upon the cause of truth. Satan was seeking by this means to oppose and destroy the work of God. The people had been greatly stirred by the Advent movement. Thousands of sinners had been converted, and faithful men were giving themselves to the work of proclaiming the truth, even in the tarrying time. The prince of evil was losing his subjects, and in order to bring reproach upon the cause of God, he sought to deceive some who professed the faith and to drive them to extremes. Then his agents stood ready to seize upon every error, every failure, every unbecoming act, 
and hold it up before the people in the most exaggerated light to render Adventists and their faith odious. Thus the greater the number whom he could crowd in to make a profession of faith in the second advent, while his power controlled their hearts, the greater advantage would he gain by calling attention to them as representatives of the whole body of believers. Satan is the accuser of the brethren, and it is his spirit that inspires men to watch for the errors and defects of the Lord's people, and to hold them up to notice, while their good deeds are passed by without a mention. He is always active when God is at work for the salvation of souls. When the sons of God come to present themselves before the Lord, Satan comes also among them. In every revival he is ready to bring in those who are unsanctified in heart and unbalanced in mind. When these have accepted some points of truth and gained a place with believers, he works through them to introduce theories that will deceive the unwary. No man is proved to be a true Christian because he is found in company with the children of God. Even in the house of worship and around the table of the Lord, Satan is frequently there upon the most solemn occasions in the form of those whom he can use as his agents. The prince of evil contests every inch of ground over which God's people advance in their journey toward the heavenly city. In all the history of the church, no reformation has been carried forward without encountering serious obstacles. Thus it was in Paul's day. Wherever the apostle raised up a church, there were some who professed to receive the faith, but who brought in heresies that if received would eventually crowd out the love of the truth. Luther also suffered great perplexity and distress from the course of fanatical persons who claimed that God had spoken directly through them and who therefore set their own ideas and opinions above the testimony of the Scriptures. Many who were lacking in faith and experience, but who had considerable self-sufficiency, and who loved to hear and tell some new thing, were beguiled by the pretensions of the new teachers, and they joined the agents of Satan in their work of tearing down what God had moved Luther to build up. And the Wesleys, and others who blessed the world by their influence and their faith, encountered at every step the wiles of Satan in pushing overzealous, unbalanced, and unsanctified ones into fanaticism of every grade. William Miller had no sympathy with those influences that led to fanaticism. He declared with Luther that every spirit should be tested by the word of God. The devil, said Miller, has great power over the minds of some at the present day. And how shall we know what manner of spirit they are of? The Bible answers, By their fruits ye shall know them. There are many spirits gone out into the world, and we are commanded to try the spirits. The spirit that does not cause us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world is not the spirit of Christ. I am more and more convinced that Satan has much to do in these wild movements, Many among us who pretend to be wholly sanctified are following the traditions of men and apparently are as ignorant of truth as others who make no such pretensions. Bliss, pages 236 and 237. The spirit of error will lead us from the truth, and the spirit of God will lead us into truth. But, say you, a man may be in error and think he has the truth. What then? We answer, the spirit and word agree. If a man judges himself by the word of God and finds a perfect harmony through the whole word, then he must believe he has the truth. But if he finds the spirit by which he is led does not harmonize with the whole tenor of God's law or book, then let him walk carefully, lest he be caught in the snare of the devil. The Advent Herald and Signs of the Times Reporter, Volume 8, Number 23, January 15, 1845. I have often obtained more evidence of inward piety from a kindling eye, a wet cheek, and a choked utterance than from all the noise in Christendom. Bliss, page 282. In the days of the Reformation, its enemies charged all the evils of fanaticism upon the very ones who were laboring most earnestly against it. A similar course was pursued by the opposers of the Advent movement and not content with misrepresenting and exaggerating the errors of extremists and fanatics. 
they circulated unfavorable reports that had not the slightest semblance of truth. These persons were actuated by prejudice and hatred. Their peace was disturbed by the proclamation of Christ at the door. They feared it might be true, yet hoped it was not, and this was the secret of their warfare against Adventists and their faith. The fact that a few fanatics worked their way into the ranks of Adventists is no more reason to decide that the movement was not of God than was the presence of fanatics and deceivers in the church in Paul's or Luther's day a sufficient excuse for condemning their work. Let the people of God arouse out of sleep and begin in earnest the work of repentance and reformation. Let them search the scriptures to learn the truth as it is in Jesus. Let them make an entire consecration to God, and evidence will not be wanting that Satan is still active and vigilant. With all possible deception he will manifest his power calling to his aid all the fallen angels of his realm. It was not the proclamation of the second advent that caused fanaticism and division. These appeared in the summer of 1844, when Adventists were in a state of doubt and perplexity concerning their real position. The preaching of the first angel's message and of the midnight cry tended directly to repress fanaticism and dissension. Those who participated in these solemn movements were in harmony. Their hearts were filled with love for one another and for Jesus, whom they expected soon to see. The one faith, the one blessed hope, lifted them above the control of any human influence and proved a shield against the assaults of Satan. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh! Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Matthew 25, 5-7 In the summer of 1844, midway between the time when it had been first thought that the 2300 days would end, and the autumn of the same year, to which it was afterward found that they extended, the message was proclaimed in the very words of Scripture, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. That which led to this movement was the discovery that the decree of Artaxerxes for the restoration of Jerusalem, which formed the starting point for the period of the 2300 days, went into effect in the autumn of the year 457 B.C., and not at the beginning of the year as had been formerly believed. Reckoning from the autumn of 457, the 2300 years terminate in the autumn of 1844. Arguments drawn from the Old Testament types also pointed to the autumn as the time when the event representing the cleansing of the sanctuary must take place. This was made very clear as attention was given to the manner in which the types relating to the first advent of Christ had been fulfilled. The slaying of the Passover lamb was a shadow of the death of Christ. Says Paul, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 The sheaf of first fruits, which at the time of the Passover was waved before the Lord, was typical of the resurrection of Christ. Paul says in speaking of the resurrection of the Lord and of all his people, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. 1 Corinthians 15, 23 Like the wave sheaf, which was the first ripe grain gathered before the harvest. Christ is the first fruits of that immortal harvest of redeemed ones that at the future resurrection shall be gathered into the garner of God. These types were fulfilled not only as to the event but as to the time. On the fourteenth day of the first Jewish month, the very day and month on which for fifteen long centuries the Passover lamb had been slain, Christ, having eaten the Passover with his disciples, instituted that feast which was to commemorate his own death as the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That same night he was taken by wicked hands to be crucified and slain. And as the antitype of the wave sheaf, our Lord was raised from the dead on the third day, the first fruits of them that slept, a sample of all the resurrected just, whose vile body shall be changed and fashioned like unto his glorious body. Verse 20, Philippians 3, 21. 
In like manner, the types which relate to the second advent must be fulfilled at the time pointed out in the symbolic service. Under the Mosaic system, the cleansing of the sanctuary, or the great day of atonement, occurred on the tenth day of the seventh Jewish month, Leviticus 16, 29-34. When the high priest, having made an atonement for all Israel, and thus removed their sins from the sanctuary, came forth and blessed the people. So it was believed that Christ, our great high priest, would appear to purify the earth by the destruction of sin and sinners, and to bless his waiting people with immortality. The tenth day of the seventh month, the great day of atonement, the time of the cleansing of the sanctuary, which in the year 1844 fell the twenty-second of October, was regarded as the time of the Lord's coming. This was in harmony with the proofs already presented that the 2300 days would terminate in the autumn, and the conclusion seemed irresistible. In the parable of Matthew 25, the time of waiting and slumber is followed by the coming of the bridegroom. This was in accordance with the arguments just presented, both from prophecy and from the types. They carried strong conviction of their truthfulness, and the midnight cry was heralded by thousands of believers. Like a tidal wave, the movement swept over the land. From city to city, from village to village, and into remote country places it went, until the waiting people of God were fully aroused. Fanaticism disappeared before this proclamation, like early frost before the rising sun. Believers saw their doubt and perplexity removed, and hope and courage animated their hearts. The work was free from those extremes which are ever manifested when there is human excitement without the controlling influence of the Word and Spirit of God. It was similar in character to those seasons of humiliation and returning unto the Lord, which among ancient Israel followed messages of reproof from His servants. It bore the characteristics that mark the work of God in every age. There was little ecstatic joy but rather deep searching of heart, confession of sin and forsaking of the world. A preparation to meet the Lord was the burden of agonizing spirits. There was persevering prayer and unreserved consecration to God. Said Miller in describing that work, There is no great expression of joy that is, as it were, suppressed for a future occasion, when all heaven and earth will rejoice together with joy unspeakable and full of glory. There is no shouting. That, too, is reserved for the shout from heaven. The singers are silent. They are waiting to join the angelic hosts, the choir from heaven. There is no clashing of sentiments. All are of one heart and of one mind. Bliss, pages 270 and 271. Another who participated in the movement testified, it produced everywhere the most deep searching of heart and humiliation of soul before the God of high heaven. It caused a weaning of affections from the things of this world, a healing of controversies and animosities, a confession of wrongs, a breaking down before God, and penitent, broken-hearted supplications to Him for pardon and acceptance. It caused self-abasement and prostration of soul, such as we never before witnessed. As God by Joel commanded, when the great day of God should be at hand, it produced a rending of hearts and not of garments, and a turning unto the Lord with fasting and weeping and mourning. As God said by Zechariah, a spirit of grace and supplication was poured out upon his children. They looked to him whom they had pierced. There was a great mourning in the land, and those who were looking for the Lord afflicted their souls before him. Bliss in Advent Shield and Review, Volume 1, page 271, January 1845. Of all the great religious movements since the days of the Apostles, none have been more free from human imperfection and the wiles of Satan than was that of the autumn of 1844. Even now, after the lapse of many years, all who shared in that movement and who have stood firm upon the platform of truth still feel the holy influence of that blessed work and bear witness that it was of God. At the call the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. 
the waiting ones aroused and trimmed their lamps. They studied the Word of God with an intensity of interest before unknown. Angels were sent from heaven to arouse those who had become discouraged and prepare them to receive the message. The work did not stand in the wisdom and learning of men, but in the power of God. It was not the most talented, but the most humble and devoted, who were the first to hear and obey the call. Farmers left their crops standing in the fields, mechanics laid down their tools, and with tears and rejoicing went out to give the warning. Those who had formerly led in the cause were among the last to join in this movement. The churches in general closed their doors against this message, and a large company of those who received it withdrew from their connection. In the providence of God this proclamation united with the second angel's message and gave power to that work. The message, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, was not so much a matter of argument, though the scripture proof was clear and conclusive. There went with it an impelling power that moved the soul. There was no doubt, no questioning. Upon the occasion of Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the people who were assembled from all parts of the land to keep the feast flocked to the Mount of Olives. And as they, joining the throng that were escorting Jesus, they caught the inspiration of the hour and helped to swell the shout, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Matthew 21, 9. In like manner did unbelievers who flocked to the Adventist meetings some from curiosity, some merely to ridicule, feel the convincing power attending the message, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. At that time there was faith that brought answers to prayer, faith that had respect to the recompense of reward. Like showers of rain upon the thirsty earth, the Spirit of grace descended upon the earnest seekers, those who expected soon to stand face to face with their Redeemer felt a solemn joy that was unutterable. The softening, subduing power of the Holy Spirit melted the heart as His blessing was bestowed in rich measure upon the faithful believing ones. Carefully and solemnly, those who received the message came up to the time when they hoped to meet their Lord. Every morning they felt that it was their first duty to secure the evidence of their acceptance with God. Their hearts were closely united, and they prayed much with and for one another. They often met together in secluded places to commune with God, and the voice of intercession ascended to heaven from the fields and groves. The assurance of the Savior's approval was more necessary to them than their daily food, and if a cloud darkened their minds, they did not rest until it was swept away. As they felt the witness of pardoning grace, they longed to behold Him whom their souls loved. But again they were destined to disappointment. The time of expectation passed, and their Savior did not appear. With unwavering confidence they had looked forward to His coming, and now they felt as did Mary, when coming to the Savior's tomb and finding it empty, she exclaimed with weeping, They have taken away my Lord and I know not where they have laid him. John 20:13. A feeling of awe, of fear that the message might be true, had for a time served as a restraint upon the unbelieving world. After the passing of the time, this did not at once disappear. At first, they dared not triumph over the disappointed ones. But as no tokens of God's wrath were seen, they recovered from their fears and resumed their reproach and ridicule. A large class who had professed to believe in the Lord's soon coming renounced their faith. Some who had been very confident were so deeply wounded in their pride that they felt like fleeing from the world. Like Jonah, they complained of God and chose death rather than life. Those who had based their faith upon the opinions of others and not upon the word of God were now as ready again to change their views. The scoffers won the weak and cowardly to their ranks, and all these united in declaring that there could be no more fears or expectations now. The time had passed, the Lord had not come, and the world might remain the same for thousands of years. 
The earnest, sincere believers had given up all for Christ and had shared His presence as never before. They had, as they believed, given their last warning to the world, and expecting soon to be received into the society of their divine Master and the heavenly angels, they had to a great extent withdrawn from the society of those who did not receive the message. With intense desire they had prayed, Come, Lord Jesus, and come quickly. But He had not come. And now to take up again the heavy burden of life's cares and perplexities, and to endure the taunts and sneers of a scoffing world, was a terrible trial of faith and patience. Yet this disappointment was not so great as was that experienced by the disciples at the time of Christ's first advent. When Jesus rode triumphantly into Jerusalem, His followers believed that He was about to ascend the throne of David and deliver Israel from her oppressors. With high hopes and joyful anticipations, they vied with one another in showing honor to their king. Many spread their outer garments as a carpet in his path, or strewed before him the leafy branches of the palm. In their enthusiastic joy, they united in the glad acclaim, Hosanna to the Son of David! When the Pharisees, disturbed and angered by this outburst of rejoicing, wished Jesus to rebuke his disciples, he replied, if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Luke 19.40 Prophecy must be fulfilled. The disciples were accomplishing the purpose of God, yet they were doomed to a bitter disappointment. But a few days had passed ere they witnessed the Savior's agonizing death and laid Him in a tomb. Their expectations had not been realized in a single particular and their hopes died with Jesus. Not till their Lord had come forth triumphant from the grave could they perceive that all had been foretold by prophecy, and that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead. Acts 17.3 Five hundred years before, the Lord had declared by the prophet Zechariah, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, thy King cometh unto thee! He is just, and having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Zechariah 9.9 9. Had the disciples realized that Christ was going to judgment and to death, they could not have fulfilled this prophecy. In like manner, Miller and his associates fulfilled prophecy and gave a message which inspiration had foretold should be given to the world, but which they could not have given had they fully understood the prophecies pointing out their disappointment and presenting another message to be preached to all nations before the Lord should come. The first and second angel's messages were given at the right time and accomplished the work which God designed to accomplish by them. The world had been looking on, expecting that if the time passed and Christ did not appear, the whole system of Adventism would be given up. But while many under strong temptation yielded their faith, there were some who stood firm. The fruits of the Advent movement, the spirit of humility and heart-searching, of renouncing of the world and reformation of life which had attended the work, testified that it was of God. They dared not deny that the power of the Holy Spirit had witnessed to the preaching of the Second Advent, and they could detect no error in their reckoning of the prophetic periods. The ablest of their opponents had not succeeded in overthrowing their system of prophetic interpretation. They could not consent without Bible evidence to renounce positions which had been reached through earnest, prayerful study of the Scriptures by minds enlightened by the Spirit of God and hearts burning with its living power. Positions which had withstood the most searching criticisms and the most bitter opposition of popular religious teachers and worldly wise men and which had stood firm against the combined forces of learning and eloquence, and the taunts and revilings alike of the honorable and the base. True, there had been a failure as to the expected event, but even this could not shake their faith in the word of God. When Jonah proclaimed in the streets of Nineveh that within forty days the city would be overthrown, the Lord accepted the humiliation of the Ninevites and extended their period of probation. 
Yet the message of Jonah was sent of God, and Nineveh was tested according to his will. Adventists believed that in like manner God had led them to give the warning of the judgment. It has, they declared, tested the hearts of all who heard it, and awakened a love for the Lord's appearing. Or it has called forth a hatred, more or less perceivable, but known to God of His coming. It has drawn a line, so that those who will examine their own hearts may know on which side of it they would have been found, had the Lord then come, whether they would have exclaimed, Lo, this is our God, we have waited for Him, and He will save us, or whether they would have called to the rocks and mountains to fall on them, to hide them from the face of Him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. God thus, as we believe, has tested His people, has tried their faith, has proved them, and seen whether they would shrink in the hour of trial from the position in which He might see fit to place them, and whether they would relinquish this world and rely with implicit confidence in the Word of God. The Advent Herald and Signs of the Times Reporter, Volume 8, Number 14, November 13, 1844. The feelings of those who still believed that God had led them in their past experience are expressed in the words of William Miller. Were I to live my life over again, with the same evidence that I then had, to be honest with God and man I should have to do as I have done. I hope that I have cleansed my garments from the blood of souls. I feel that as far as it was in my power I have freed myself from all guilt in their condemnation. Although I have been twice disappointed, wrote this man of God, I am not yet cast down or discouraged. My hope in the coming of Christ is as strong as ever. I have done only what, after years of solemn consideration, I felt it my solemn duty to do. If I have erred, it has been on the side of charity, love to my fellow men, and conviction of duty to God. One thing I do know, I have preached nothing but what I believed, and God has been with me. His power has been manifested in the work, and much good has been effected. Many thousands, to all human appearance, have been made to study the Scriptures by the preaching of the time, and by that means, through faith in the sprinkling of the blood of Christ, have been reconciled to God. Bliss, pages 256, 255, 277, 280, and 281. I have never courted the smiles of the proud, nor quailed when the world frowned. I shall not now purchase their favor, nor shall I go beyond duty to tempt their hate. I shall never seek my life at their hands, nor shrink, I hope, from losing it, if God in His good providence so orders. J. White, Life of William Miller, page 315. God did not forsake His people. His Spirit still abode with those who did not rashly deny the light which they had received, and denounce the Advent movement. In the epistle to the Hebrews are words of encouragement and warning for the tried waiting ones at this crisis. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Hebrews 10, 35-39 That this admonition is addressed to the church in the last days is evident from the words pointing to the nearness of the Lord's coming. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. And it is plainly implied that there would be a seeming delay, and that the Lord would appear to tarry. The instruction here given is especially adapted to the experience of Adventists at this time. The people here addressed were in danger of making shipwreck of faith. They had done the will of God in following the guidance of His Spirit and His Word. Yet they could not understand his purpose in their past experience, nor could they discern the pathway before them, and they were tempted to doubt whether God had indeed been leading them. At this time the words were applicable, Now the just shall live by faith. 
as the bright light of the midnight cry had shone upon their pathway, and they had seen the prophecies unsealed and the rapidly fulfilling signs telling that the coming of Christ was near, they had walked, as it were, by sight. But now, bowed down by disappointed hopes, they could stand only by faith in God and in His Word. The scoffing world were saying, You have been deceived. Give up your faith and say that the Advent movement was of Satan. But God's word declared, If any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. To renounce their faith now and deny the power of the Holy Spirit which had attended the message would be drawing back toward perdition. They were encouraged to steadfastness by the words of Paul, Cast not away therefore your confidence. Ye have need of patience, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Their only safe course was to cherish the light which they had already received of God, hold fast to his promises, and continue to search the scriptures, and patiently wait and watch to receive further light.